And uh, one of the reasons why, okay, how many have heard of the armor of God? Everybody misunderstands the armor of God. It is not what you think it is. So we'll be talking about that, what the armor of God really is. Uh, how many sheep attack the wolf? Uh, where do they go? To the shepherd. The battle is the Lord's. The victory is ours. People need to understand the armor of God. It's not a Roman soldier's costume. Okay. You're going to find it's the armor of the priesthood, and we fight the battle on our knees in prayer. And the Lord goes and fights Satan. But we're going to look at that in a couple of weeks because that's in Ephesians. And we just started the book of Ephesians. That's where we're going to end. But for starters, let's take a look at something here. As you know, <coughs> the previous three weeks has been known as the dire straits. That's from the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Ab, which was last Shabbat, was the 9th of Ab. Amazingly, last Shabbat <coughs> was the exact day Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. It was also the exact day the Romans destroyed the temple 600 years later. It's also the exact day the spies brought the bad report. Okay, <coughs> 17th of Tammuz is when they worshiped the golden calf. <coughs> so these last three weeks have just been a horrible time of fasting and prayer for Israel. But uh, as I said, that's when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. That is when uh, Rome destroyed the temple. But now <coughs> what is going on is this. Now begins the Sabbaths of consolation. The month of Ab means dad. No one likes getting punished by dad, but he does it for our good. And so now comes what's called the Sabbaths of comfort, where the Haftarah portions or the portions of the prophets that go with it. Uh, today is Vayet Canaan, the first consolation. And uh, the Haftarah portion you see is Isaiah 40, 1 through 26. So these actually here are the next seven weeks of consoling Israel through the Haftarah portions. And if you guys want to take a picture of that, I don't care if you take pictures. Okay, so here we go with our notes. As a matter of fact, uh, to me, this day is absolutely incredible. One of my favorite Torah portions. <coughs> but the reason why it was on this day in 2008 that I discovered the blood moons that have been talked about and written about for the last, you know, years. It was back in 2000. This was the day I presented it to everybody. Now, let me say this. When something that is traumatic or emotionally painful that happens to someone that we really care about, do we try to comfort that person? Of course we do. We offer words of consolation. We offer words of sympathy. We always try to point to the bright side. We try to lift up that person's spirits by talking about the future, okay? That's what this Sabbath is all about. Israel has been through trauma. Now, I don't have this verse on your notes, but it just comes to my mind. In Romans chapter 12, it says, well, Romans 11 is all about Israel, being grafted into Israel, Romans 11. The very next chapter 12 says, rejoice with those that do rejoice, and then weep with those that weep. So what that means is during the last three weeks and then the ninth of Bob, while they're fasting and praying and asking for God's forgiveness, how much more for the non-Jews that are grafted into Israel, if we really love Israel, we're going to want to be comforting them. Does that make sense? Okay. And so this next seven weeks, uh, all the non-Jews, we should be studying the consolations. Uh, and so where that idea of giving consolation the Hof Torah, look at it. Up at the top, it says it's Isaiah 40, verse 1 through 26. Guess what Isaiah 40 is all about? It's about Messiah starting his ministry, consoling Israel. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. Comfort you, comfort you, my people, says God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry to her 
that her warfare is accomplished, her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Wow. And this is always read every year after the ninth of Av, after they've been, you know, in all this trouble with dad, now we're to speak comfort to them. Look at Psalms 137, verse 1 and 2. This is written while they were in Babylon. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Well, guess what? In the Gospels, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, it says, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. If not us as Christians, who else is going to comfort those that are mourning in Zion? No one else is. And then I have here right after Romans 11, where God tells us we're grafted in, it's chapter 12, verse 15, that we're to rejoice when they rejoice and weep when they weep. So this is why we have to be on the biblical calendar so we know when this is rejoicing. We know when they're weeping. <clears throat> now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all what? Who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. <clears throat> you can't comfort somebody if you've never really been in trouble yourself and have been comforted. How do you relate? How often does something tragic happen and you try to offer comfort and they say, you don't understand. You have no clue what it's like to lose a child, have your house burned down. I mean, you want to give comfort, but a lot of times you know those people can't really relate because they haven't been through it, okay? Until you've had God comfort you, how can you offer God's comfort to someone else? But I tell you what, though, the good thing is this is why we're all dysfunctional, <laughs> we're all a mess but that's a good thing because then God can comfort us and then we have something to offer other people Lamentations is read every year on the 9th of Av this is where Jem Jeremiah is lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem and it says concerning Jerusalem, she weeps sore in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all of her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her, and they have become her enemies. Wow. Have you ever had a friend who you thought was a friend become an enemy? Oh, my goodness. And then what's interesting uh, here. In verse 9, it goes on to say she has no one to comfort her. Absolutely no one. And then look at Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. It says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I do have hope. Surely the Lord's mercies are not consumed. Surely his compassions don't fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How many of you are glad that God is merciful and compassionate? Okay. Well, this Torah portion begins with Moses begging God for mercy. I mean, who wouldn't answer Moses? He's the most faithful in all God's house, and he's begging for mercy, and God says, no, quit talking. What? Let's look at it. It's Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 through 25. Moses says, I beg the Lord at that, saying, Lord, the Lord, you've begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to your works and according to your mighty acts? He's kind of greasing it a little bit, you know. And then he goes, please, please, please let me go into over and see the good land. That's beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain. In Lebanon. In other words, he's saying, fine, if you don't want me to lead, I don't have to lead, but let me go in. I'll follow. I'll be at the back. Verse 26 and 27, Moses says, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. He didn't listen to me. And the Lord said to me, speak no more of this matter. Let it suffice you. You go up to the top of Pisgah, lift your eyes west, north, south, and eastward, and see with your eyes. But you're not going over Jordan. You can go up and take a look. This is up at Mount Nebo. 
Can you imagine standing up on Mount Nebo in Jordan and you get to see what you can see, but you can't go over? Well, we're going to be there next October in case anybody wants to go. We're going to be going to Israel and Jordan, and we're going to, so sign up. All right, aside from that, dude, but here's the thing that Moses doesn't understand. He's going to see it within 24 hours because he's going to pass away, and then he'll be able to see it. Matter of fact, he got to go there at the transfiguration in the Gospels. He's standing there with Elijah, for heaven's sake. He just had to have patience. So look at Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2. Now, Israel, I want you to listen. And we all know from the Hebrew, that means more than listen. It, it means to hear and obey. Don't just hear it, do it. He says, listen to these statutes and the ordinances, which I'm going to teach you to what? To do them that they might kill you and you would be under bondage. No, that you might live. And you go in and possess the land the Lord, the God of your fathers gives you. And then look at this. Don't you be adding any words to what I command you and neither diminish from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Does it just sound a little bit like Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, where it says, don't you be adding or subtracting any word from this revelation? Well, that, this is where that comes from. Because we don't want any man-made commandments. That's what happens. Man-made commandments come when we add, we subtract, thinking we have the authority to edit God's work. Wow, that's pretty scary. But it's not your commandments. It's the Lord's commandments. You know, uh, when you understand the Jewish culture, the greatest thing that someone can do is to go to work for dad. That's what it is. I get to go to work for dad and with dad. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> now, they want to join dad in what he's doing. This is why things, trades get passed from father to son and stays within the family. Well, here's the thing. The son doesn't work for dad to become a son or daughter. They work for dad because they are their sons and daughters. So the Jews have never thought they have to work, do good works to get to heaven. That's never what they thought. They do the works that God told them to do because that's dad. And so they don't work to become God's children. They believe they need to work because dad wants to put them to work. They don't make their bed because they want to. <laughs> they make their dad bed because dad said make your bed. Okay. Now. Here's the other thing. Listen to Genesis first, chapter 2, verse 24. Everyone knows this verse where it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Okay, what does that word cleave mean? It means to become one, to join together. It's, it's a, like a, a wedding. Well, look at Deuteronomy 4.4. 4. It says, those of you had the, that did cleave to the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. Wow, that's amazing. So the Torah portion focuses on an important concept that we need to learn. It's how do we cleave to God? How do we cleave to him? It is only by cleaving to God, as this verse says, that we're able to then have the life that we were intended to have and live it to the full. Through doing the commandments, we are joined to God, and then we bring his will into the world. We just got done praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, guess what? He can only do it through you. And so if you don't do his will, how is his will going to get done? And what is his will? It's doing what he says, not doing what we want to do for him. I'm a gardener, okay, and I love flowers, and I get hired to work at McDonald's to be a cook, but I don't cook. I go out and I do the flowers all around the move restaurant. What happens? I get fired. Okay? I'm supposed to do what the boss has to do, not what I want to do for him. There's more to that. You will see. Okay. His commandments are his will. So when we say your will be done, we are fulfilling his will. Does that make sense? 
People always say, well, what is the will of God for my life? Don't do what he says. Pretty simple. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. Behold, I've taught you statutes and ordinances, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the midst of the land that you're going to possess. And then he says, keep therefore and do. There's a big difference between keep and do. You can keep something, but not do something, okay? I cannot do all the commandments. Some of the commandments can only be done in Israel. I'm over here. Some of the commandments are for judges. I'm not a judge. Some commandments are for farmers. I'm not a farmer. Some commandments are for women. I'm not they, them, or her, okay? (laughs) And so uh, what we have to realize is, but we can keep all the commandments, I can, I can protect them. I can guard them and make sure that no one tries to take them away or add to them. So I can keep all the commandments, but I can't do all the commandments. All right. Now, look at this. It says, by keeping and doing God's commandments, this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the nations. And they're going to hear of these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there that has a God so near to them as the Lord our God is whenever we call on him? What great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? And now, often the church says, oh, these statutes and ordinances are dumb and stupid and we don't want anything to do with them. And it's like, these are for your protection. And the nations, uh, see, a lot of the Jewish people don't think the nations should follow Torah. Well, no, wait a minute. The nations are supposed to come and say, wow, these are sure wise and great laws. We ought to implement some of these laws too. That is the whole purpose. Now, again, there's some laws the nations can't do because they're not Israel. All right? So we have to understand how everything is laid out. Okay, Deuteronomy 4.9. It says, just take heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life but teach them to your sons and to your sons sons your grandkids got to know this the enemy wants to attack the kids they always start with the children if they can get the children when they're in kindergarten or first grade or up through high school they got them okay and the problem is much of us have turned our kids over to the world to learn. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, 28 through 31. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you're going to find him. Okay, but there's a condition. It's only if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. The problem is uh, many people don't seek after God until they're in trouble. And then they seek after God. And then when they find him, they say, okay, thank you. Put them on the shelf and go back to their ways. We have to seek for God, not just in the bad times, but in the good times. That's what's important. That's why we, ha- the main thing is just seek him. You know, I might, I might be sitting in my chair and I might want a cup of coffee, but I'm not willing to go up and get it. Hey, Vicki, would you give me a cup of coffee? <laughs> No, God if, wants you not just to want him if he happens to come by, but we have to go look for him. I, I, I don't know. I, I just thought of this. How many of you, I can't remember the name of it. I'm sure many of you will, but they have these car deals where you go on a treasure hunt and everyone goes around trying to find something. You ever did that? Maybe that's just an old Kansas thing. Oh, what? A scavenger hunt? Yeah, yeah something along that line, you know that's how we need to look for God. We need to be passionate and look for him. Come on, where are you hiding? I'm going to go look for you. You can't hide for long. But that's what God's looking for. Okay. And then look at this. When you're in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, this is talking about the coming tribulation. It says, you will return to the Lord your God. You'll obey his voice for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He's not going to leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Now, this next verse is probably one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And it really is. Deuteronomy 5.29. Listen to God's heart. I want you to hear God's heartbeat. What does he have to say about himself? 
He says, oh, I wish there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Wow. He did not give us his commandments because he wa- a legalistic judge that wants to make kids' lives miserable. He did it because he loves them. And he says, don't put your hand in a blender while it's running. And then we stick our hand in the blender and then we curse God because we got our hand cut. Just do what he says and it'll be a lot better. As a matter of fact, let's go to the New Testament. In 1 John 2, 3 through 6, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He says, I know him, but doesn't keep the commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whatever keeps his word, and him barely is the love of God perfected, and hereby know that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to what? Walk, which means even as he walked, do what he does. First John three twenty four, he that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he's given us. First John five, two and three. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Thou shalt not steal. Is only a grievous commandment to those who want to steal. Okay, Deuteronomy 6, the most famous verse in the Bible. 4 and 5. Shema Yisrael, <laughs> Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Akkad. Uh, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Can you imagine? That has to be one of the strangest commandments of the whole Bible, even though it's the greatest commandment. Can you command someone to love you? Can you imagine? You're in high school. I command you to love me. (laughs) How is that going to go over? (laughs) And yet here, look at what God is saying. Not only I want you to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. Okay, well, let me show you something that you never see in English. You only see in Hebrew. Uh, Here is what it looks like. Now, uh, who said something? Who knows what that says? Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Okay, hero Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. But in every Torah scroll... The letter ayin is made real big, and the letter dalit is made real big. Now, they don't make the first and last letters in English big, so you miss something that's happening. Okay, you take those two big letters, put them together, you get the word ed, okay, Uh, which basically uh, is like a light to see, to do, to be aware. Well, guess what? If you change one letter, that ayin to the alef, which makes the same sound, and it's really actually silent, and if you change that dalit on the end to a resh, which is very close, you now have the phrase, perhaps the Lord our God is another God. Making a slight change from The Hebrew, thinking, well, it doesn't make any difference. I'll let the silent, just like I, the doll and the race is just a corner. How I hear that make a difference? It makes all the difference in the world. Okay, and then what do we find? In Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, these words which I command you this day shall be where? And so it's important that your heart is not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. That makes a big difference. Okay, and then it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. What's interesting about the Hebrew word diligently, it implies you have to chew them first before you can teach your kids. You can't tell the kids, oh, just, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't work. And then it says, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, walk on the, by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, and then bind them for a sign upon your hand. They'll be for symbols between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost 
of your house and upon your gates. Who knows what the Hebrew word for doorpost is? Mezuzah. That's why they put the mezuzahs on their doorposts. That's the Hebrew word for doorpost is mezuzah. And inside every one of them is a scroll that has the greatest commandment. You can see the big ayin and the big dalit. So that, the commandment, the greatest commandment is what is rolled up in the mezuzah and hung on the doorpost. So it's the word of God. The word of God is hung on the doorpost. Okay. Now, with that being said, where is the house of God? Jerusalem. The temple is the house of God. And you're to put them on, not only on the doorpost, but also at the gates. This is why the word of God was hung at the gates of Jerusalem on a stick of wood. Messiah is the mezuzah hung at the doorpost and the gates of Jerusalem. That is, and he's the word of God that's wrapped up within that. Amazing. And then look at Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our what? Good, that he might keep us alive as this day. It'll be righteousness to us if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Okay, so look at this. Wow, by doing the mitzvot or the doing the commandments, the good works, it does become our righteousness. Are you following me? Okay, it doesn't get us to heaven, but we get rewarded for the good works. How many of you, when you work, you get a paycheck? Okay, and that's because you're doing the work, you get paid. If you don't work, you get fired. <laughs> Now, look at Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God, he's God, the faithful God, which he's covenant and mercy with them that do what? Love him and keep his commandments to how many generations? Wow, do you think this is where John got that verse, those who love him keep his commandments? He didn't say, oh, no, the Torah's all done away with, and now we don't have to do that. Now, it says, God says, that love him and keep his commandments to how many generations? Hmm, if a generation 60 years, that's 60,000 years. Well, wait a minute. We've only been here 6,000 years. So I guess it's not done away with yet. Okay, now, remember I, I quoted Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2 earlier as part of the Haftorah? But watch what happens now. John 1, 23, John is saying, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Oh, my goodness. He's quoting Isaiah. Well, let's go to Isaiah 40. There it is. Verse 3 and 4, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be exalted. Every mountain and hill will be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places made plain. Okay, so John is quoting Isaiah. But what many Christians don't understand, he keeps on quoting Isaiah 40. It doesn't end there. We think he just quoted those, ver those few verses. No, he continues to read the book of Isaiah 40, and you're going to see why. Look at this. Verse 5. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see him together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. In Hebrew, it says it, but that's English, I mean, it says it. But there is no it. It's him. Here it says the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed, and everyone's going to see him. And there he is standing there as he's reading this. Now, here is, that is the, I think, the King James. Listen to the Jewish publication society's translation of that verse. The presence of the Lord shall appear and all flesh as one shall behold. And what does John say? The next day he saw Yeshua coming and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. He's reading, as he's saying this, he's reading the chapter and bringing these in as he's talking. 
Look at Isaiah 46 through 9. The voice said, cry. And he said, what am I supposed to cry? That all flesh is grass, all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the Spirit of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades. How many have heard that verse in the book of James? This is from the book of James. James didn't come up with anything new. He's quoting what is already there. Okay? And so while we fade away, the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that brings the gospel, good tidings. Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that brings the gospel or good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift up. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, what? Behold your God. And here John is saying, behold, there's the Lamb of God. But here's the problem. How many of us know the word of God is likened to food? Is that right? The problem is GMO. Man has been genetically modifying the word of God for the last 2,000 years. We're not supposed to add or subtract or edit the word of God. We'll stop there. Uh, let's stand. We'll pray. And then uh, we'll have a, like a 20-minute break, 15 or 20 minutes of worship. And then we'll come back with the second half. Now, something because uh, I, I didn't speak a couple of weeks ago and only spoke uh, the first half last week, there's something that I wanted to start, uh, and I started it, and then I was getting emails from all over uh, from nations. Let me just check something here right now. Let me just see what we've got here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, here we go. As of right now, we have 181 cities and 12 nations watching right now. Woohoo! <laughs> but here's the thing. I was, I was telling people, I wanted to pray for the different nations. We need to pray for the other nations. So I had three nations call. <laughs> pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. Uh, the nation of Peru. Someone in Peru said, please pray for Peru because the Torah less government is bringing Peru down. Someone from England said, pray for the spirit of fear to be released, people to be released from the, the grip of fear, and for love to come in as perfect love casts out fear. And that's where the nation of England is at. And then someone said, Japan, we need to pray for revival and the salvation for the Japanese people. And if any of you from any of these other nations um, want to email us, uh, markbilt at msn.com is mine or esm.us. We want to pray for your nation as well. So let's take a moment and pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father or King. We just thank you so much for all those around the United States and all those around the world that are watching. And at this time, we want to lift up Peru. Father, we pray for a government uh, that would follow you. We know the king's hand, uh, the king's heart, I mean, is in your hand. And so, Father, bring people uh, around the governmental leaders, Lord, that might follow you and, and bring your government here on earth as it is in heaven. And for England, right now, we just lift the nation of England up to you right now. We pray that the spirit of fear would be uh, gone from its midst, Father. And we do pray for love perfect love to come into England. Uh, we pray for a revival in England. Uh, Father, uh, it has a long history of Christianity, and it's, it's becoming more and more Islamic. Uh, and Father, we just pray for a true, uh, your trueness, truthfulness to enter into England and your spirit. And for Japan, we also pray for uh, a revival and for salvation of the Japanese people. We know that's one of the most unchurched uh, countries in the world. And Father, we just pray that uh, a revelation of you uh, would come to the Japanese people. Father, we thank you so much for all those around the world and all those around the United States that are uh, committed to helping us take the Torah to the nations. And so, Father, we just bless uh, and pray that you would bless any tithes or offerings that are coming in Father, that we can continue to be a light in this dark world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen.
together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Let those that are new here for the first time kind of get in line first down at the food and coffee. Okay, are you ready? Buckle up. I am so excited about starting the book of Ephesians, and we'll be looking at it from another perspective. Uh, you can take a look at the, the map here. You can see where Caesarea is and then Antioch, and right there is Ephesus. And next Sunday, I'm going to be there with about 100 people. Woohoo! And we're going to go up to Philippi, over to Athens, and we're going to be in Corinth, and it's going to be so much fun. Here's part of Ephesus, what it looks like right there, some of the remains. And I want everyone to know the Bible that I'm quoting from the most during this is, uh, and you'll see it on your notes where it says H-H-B-N-T, that is called the Hebrew Heritage Bible New Testament by Brad Young. And so uh, those of you that want to, be sure and watch it uh, or get it if you want. Uh, let me say this. I forgot to say this earlier. Flap my hand. But for the blind, the blind always want me to give the date. And so uh, today is August 13th of 2022. The Torah portion was by at Canaan. Uh, we have a ministry to the blind. We got a ministry to the deaf. Of course, we have translations going on as well. Russian, you know, we have some people helping with Korean and we have Hispanic and uh, we have live translators behind us uh, doing this. So this is exciting. Okay, before we can understand the book of Ephesians, we need to understand Ephesus. Okay, so we're going to start in the book of Revelation. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, So then to the angel who's appointed over the congregation of Ephesus, now that word angel could be messenger or pastor or something along that line, doesn't have to mean angel, angel. Right, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, it's the one who's walking among the seven lampstands made of gold. He's the one who's saying this. So we know this is Yeshua talking here. And look at what he says concerning Ephesus. I am well acquainted with your deeds, all of your hard work, your determined perseverance. You cannot tolerate people consumed with wrongdoing. You put to the test even those who call themselves authoritative emissaries, but they are not, and you discovered them to be false. You've demonstrated perseverance. You've endured hard struggles for my namesake, and yet you've grown weary. Or, and you've not grown weary. You've not grown weary. So This sounds like someone who's doing a lot of good works. They're persevering to the end. They're going through tribulation. But why? He says, but you don't no longer love me as you did at the first. Here there are people who work hard for the Lord, but that doesn't tell you that they love the Lord. And that is amazing to me. Here are people that are involved in all these wonderful works and they're enduring tribulation. And it's the church. It's a church at Ephesus. And God says, but you don't love me. I, I can't help but think of a spouse who goes to work every day for his wife, working hard, but they... Where happened? Can you relate to that? Can anyone relate to that? We can work hard, but lose the relationship. Does that make sense? This is where Ephesus is at. It's not that they don't love him. I want you to know they do love the Lord, but the passion's gone. Now they're just doing wonderful works, but that same passion's gone. This is huge. Look at verse 5 through 7. He goes on to say, Remember then the high position from where you've fallen. 
Repent right now and do the good works you performed at the start. Wait a minute. They were doing all these works, but they weren't good works. Why? Because it was their works they're trying to do for God rather than his works he wanted them to do. They're planting flowers instead of flipping boogers. You following me? Okay. It's like my wife loves flowers, but I bring her chocolates. And she's allergic to chocolate. That even makes it worse. Okay. Look at Revelation 2, 5 through 7. Okay, here we are. He says, repent right now. And then he says, and I will have to remove your lamb stand out of its place. That is, unless you repent, of course, at once. Does he say you can repent down the road or when you feel like it? No. And then it says, even so, you do have this in your favor. You hate the doings of the Nicolaitans. How many have read that verse? How many of you know what the Nicolaitans do? <laughs> if you don't know what the Nicolaitans do, how do you know that, what is it that he hates? Okay. He says, which I also despise. Then he says, let everyone who has ears listen, pay close attention to what the Spirit teaches the congregations. And to everyone who overcomes, I will give the privilege of eating from the tree of life, which is in the Garden of Eden. Wow. So he hates the doing of the Nicolaitans. So let's find out what that's about. And let's let the Bible interpret itself rather than me trying to tell you what it is. Well, let's go for a minute to Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Look at this. Oh, let me tell you the background. This is where uh, people were upset because some of the uh, people weren't being taken care of. So they said, why don't you apostles stick to studying the word and let's get some deacons to help take care of everybody. Everyone familiar with that? Okay, so look what happens. This saying was pleasing to all of them and they made a selection of Stephen, the wonderful guy, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas. He's the one who started the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And guess what? He was a Gentile who had become a Jew. So he doesn't have any of the background of the Bible. He's a convert who probably converted for the wrong reasons. And look what it says now. Let's go. This I added. Sorry, I added this verse to the, your notes. But you can reference it and I'll read it. In Numbers chapter 22, verse 31, you all know the story where the Lord opens the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he falls on his face. You know the story. Well, let's go to the next church in Revelation chapter 2, which is in Pergamos, which is where the seat of Satan is. And let's read about this group. It says, so then also to the angel appointed over the congregation in Pergamum, right? Here's the guy that has that sharp two-edged sword. This is referring to the one back in Balaam's time. And it says, say this, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is located. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even during the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was martyred before your eyes. Where Satan lives, even so, I have a few things against you because you have among you some of those who hold fast to the message of Balaam. So here, this is a direct re reference to the angel with the sword in his hand over Balaam's head. And he says, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block in the way of the children of Israel. And what was that stumbling block? To eat food, sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of sexual misconduct. So also in a similar way, okay, this means doing that same type of thing. You have among you those who hold fast to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So the teaching of the Nicolaitans is very similar to eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. 
But this is a church. How can people go to church and think it's okay to do these things? Well, he says, repent right now or else I will come to you quickly. I will make war against them with the sword which is in my mouth. And what sword is that in his mouth? The word of God. And then he said, let everyone who has ears to hear, listen, pay close attention to what the Spirit is saying to the congregations. To the one who overcomes, I will give to that individual some of the hidden manna and the white stone with a new name carved upon the stone, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Can you imagine that? You get a special name. You know, uh, I grew up, nine kids, each one of us had a pet name that, you know, our mom gave each one of us, you know. I won't tell you some of mine, you're too embarrassing. But uh, one of them was Mickey Mouse. Uh, but that's because I had a little Mickey Mouse hat on when I was like one and a half years old when I visited my dad in the hospital, and they got a picture of it, so that's where that came from. But uh, anyway, I just think that's cool. That so many of us love to have a name that someone calls us and no one else. You know what I mean? Don't you call it anyone now. You call me that. You know? Uh, and so that's, I think it's cool that the Lord loves each one of us individually, that he's going to give each one of us a new name. Wow. Well, guess what? We just got done reading the doctrine of the Nicolaitans had to do with eating food, sacrifice to idols. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, right? And committing sexual immorality. Well, guess what? In Aramaic, the word Nikolai means Let's eat. Now, what's fascinating about that is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that the Lord hates appears to have been a form of antinomianism. Now, I don't know if you know what that means, but nomos in the Greek means the law. So basically, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was against Torah. It makes the fatal mistake that man can now freely partake in sin because the law of God is no longer in effect. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It held that the truth of righteousness was freely given, but supposed that a mere intellectual belief in that had enough saving power. Can you believe it? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans is one that says the law is done away with. And so, let's go back to Acts chapter 19, verse 1 and 2 to see what else happened in Ephesus. It happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul travels through the upper country, and guess what? He arrives in Ephesus, and he found some disciples, and he said, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, who's that? (laughs) We don't even know there's a Holy Spirit. What's that about? Okay, well, this is where this happened, at Ephesus. And on that map, you can see Ephesus right on the Mediterranean. And so in Acts 19, 8 through 10, oh, and I think, I believe, by the way, when we get to Ephesus, right there on the Mediterranean, we're going to do an immersion, and we're going to baptize people right there at the very same place those people first received the Holy Spirit. woo Okay. But now look at verse 8 through 10. Afterwards, he entered the Jewish learning center or the synagogue, and he continued speaking out with boldness for three whole months, carrying on discussions, persuading people all about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and would not be persuaded, they began to speak negatively concerning the way before the people. And so he withdrew from them. And then leading the disciples with him, he started carrying on discussions every day in a lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years. So everyone who lived in Asia heard the message of the Lord, both Jewish people and the Greeks as well. But guess what? They're not meeting house to house. They're meeting together. Everyone, uh, when they met, when it mentions they met house to house, that talks about for Havdalah, okay, or, you know, Arab Shabbat, they come together. That's when they met house to house. But uh, the Jews and Greeks would always meet together that were believers. Okay, but now look what happens in Acts 19, verse 13 through 15. In addition, there were some Jewish exorcists who wanted to exorcise demons out of the Gentiles or other Jews. And they wandered around from place to place, place, and they tried to use the authority of the name of the Lord Yeshua by invoking it over those who had the evil spirits. And they would say, I order you by Yeshua, whom Paul proclaims. Sceva, a man of Jewish high priestly descent, 
had seven sons who were doing this. And the evil spirit, however, answered and said to them, well, I know who Yeshua is. I know about Paul, but who are you? And so on verse 16 through 20, the man in whom the evil spirit was found, he jumped on all seven of them, subdued them with blows with sheer strength, overpowered them until they broke away, running out of the house, stripped of their clothes and seriously injured. That'll learn them. And then it says, this became widely known, I can imagine, to everyone living in Ephesus. The Jewish people and the Greeks alike all heard about it. And so fear gripped them all, and the name of the Lord Yeshua was being magnified. Many among those who had believed continued to come forward, openly confessing and disclosing their former practices. Moreover, many of those who had practiced the magic arts collected their books together, burned them publicly in the presence of everyone. When they added up the cost, they found it to be worth 50,000 pieces of silver. So the Lord, the word of the Lord is spreading with immense power. Okay, but guess what happens now in Ephesus, verse 23 through 27. About that time, serious trouble was stirred up concerning the way. And it all started because of a silversmith named Demetrius who made silver model shrines of Artemis. He was creating a brisk business trade environment for workers of the silver craft trade. He gathered together all these workers of similar craft occupations and he said, friends, you know our prosperity comes from this work. Now you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also throughout almost all of Asia. This Paul has persuaded and turned away considerable number of people claiming that gods made with human hands are not gods. Not only is there real danger that this trade of ours will be discredited, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as worthless and that she will be dethroned from her majesty, the goddess whom everyone in Asia and the world now worships. My goodness. You know, I can't help, you know, but I, I can say this because I was one uh, and that is a Catholic. And oh my goodness, we would have all these little crosses, medallions, scapulars. I wore a scapular. I don't know how many of you know what a scapular is. But uh, oh my goodness, we always thought you know, we were protected by these things, uh, and they almost get to be worshipped. But anyway, look at this. Here's another awesome connection. Here we are back in Acts. Look at what happens now. Here, Demetrius is in the midst of this big Colosseum, and all these thousands of people are there. And in Acts 19, 33 through 36, some of the people crowded around Alexander, since some of the Jewish people there had pushed him forward. Here's this Poor guy named Alexander, all the Jews are pushing him forward to confront the crowd who's yelling about for two hours, basically, great is Artemis. Anyone know who Alexander is? I'm going to tell you. It's quite exciting, but let me finish the story. Okay. Motioning with his hand for quiet, Alexander wanted to make a defense before the crowd, but as soon as they recognized that he was Jewish... A shout in unison arose as they all shouted for how long? Two hours. Great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Finally, after quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, people of Ephesus, after all, is there anyone who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell down from heaven? Since these facts are undeniable, you should keep calm and not do anything rush. Well, guess what? Do you remember Simon of Cyrene who carried the Lord's cross? Alexander was one of his kids. And he came from Ephesus. They were traveling down for that Passover. Look right here, Mark 15, 21. And they made one Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who were going by, coming from the country, going with them that he might take his cross. But look at Romans 16, 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Alexander and Rufus, the two kids that followed their dad carrying the cross, got saved and became strong believers. Isn't that cool? But look how Acts 19 closes. They're all yelling for two hours. Great is Artemis. It says, as it is, this is the town clerk speaking, we are in danger of being accused of an insurrection in connection with today's events. Since there's no cause, we will be able to give for this riot. And after saying this, he broke up and dismissed the crowd. Well, guess what? In King James, it says they dismiss the assembly. Well, guess what? The Hebrew or the Greek word is the ecclesia, the ecclesia. 
what? Then they dismiss the church. Well, we can't put church in, so we're going to put down what it really is, an assembly. Because the word ecclesia doesn't mean and never meant church. How many of you heard of the Pentateuch? That was written 200 years before Christ came, and all through it is the word ecclesia. It meant assembly, and it was talking about the assembly of Israel. But because they wanted to create a distinction between the church and the synagogue, how many of you know words can take on different meaning? Remember the Bible, it talks about those in gay apparel. That means something different now. Okay, well, guess what? They changed the meaning of ecclesia to church. But it never meant church, it meant an assembly. Synagogue is the Greek word for what? Synagogue. But guess what? Synagogue, synagogue and ecclesia were synonyms. They both meant assembly. But guess what the English translators did? How many you believe the media is biased? So were the translators. What they did, they translated ecclesia as church everywhere. But when it came to here, oops, we need to put down what it really means, assembly, because we don't want people to think the church were the ones worshiping Diana. Well, guess what? In the book of James, which isn't even James, it's really Jacob, okay, it talks about if one comes into your assembly with a gold ring, rich apparel, don't prefer them, you're all familiar with that verse, guess what? The word is synagogue there, but oh my goodness, we don't want people to know they're meeting in the synagogue, so we're going to translate it as assembly. But it's really synagogue. Well, guess what happens? In Revelation, where it talks about the synagogue of Satan, the word is synagogue. How come they don't translate as assembly of Satan? Oh, because now we want to equate the synagogue to Satan. So in English, I'm telling you, even in King James, there are a lot of bias. And there are, I hate to tell you King James only people, intentional mistranslations. And I can show you them, if anyone emails me, where all the intentional mistranslations are. Anyway, moving on. Okay, so... Now we're ready to begin Ephesians. You ready to begin Ephesians? You know, the Ephesus was quite a place, a lot going on. Ephesians 1, and here's the other thing. Uh, I don't have it bolded on your notes. I I bolded it later on mine. But I want you to notice how often the word anointed one appears. Paul, an authoritative emissary of the anointed one, Yeshua, by the will of God, to the holy people who are where? Where? at Ephesus, and to those who are faithful in the anointed one, Yeshua. Grace and shalom to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the anointed one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, the anointed one, who has blessed us by the anointed one, providing every spiritual blessing in the heavenly spheres. Wow, so when it comes to the word anointing, what does anointing mean? And what is the Hebrew word for anointing? Well, let's go here. The uh, word for anointed is Mashiach, which is where we get the word Messiah from. Okay, that is uh, very important. And who were anointed? In the Bible, who were anointed? What offices? The prophets, the priests, and the kings, and I have the biblical references underneath. Well, guess what? Yeshua was a prophet, he was a priest, and he is a king. He fulfills all of them, all right? But here's the other thing. Many of you pray the Amidah, are familiar. Who, is there anyone here who is not familiar with the Amidah? So I can, everyone's familiar with the Amidah? The Amidah, the word Amidah means to stand. And it is known as the standing prayer. So everyone would stand when this prayer is made, right? When you read Acts, when uh, Peter and John were going up the temple at the hour of prayer, and there was a man who was lame in his feet from birth, it's an inaccurate English translation. It wasn't at the hour of prayer. It was at the hour of the prayer. And the prayer was the Amidah. This man has been praying for 40 years to stand for the standing prayer. And most Christians miss it because they don't realize that that's what it's all about. And so it says he jumped up and he stood and walked and leaping, but it's totally missed if you don't know the culture. Anyway, part of the Amidah, this phrase here, Paul, how many know Paul was Jewish? Just want to make sure. Okay. 
he's almost quoting from the Amidah, where he, in the first part of the Amidah, the first prayer is, blessed are you, O Lord our God and God of our fathers. And this is what he's saying here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua. So he's pulling from the Amidah in these verses. Okay, now let's look at Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, Look at this. He destined us to be picked out for adoption. Wow. How many of you would love to be adopted by Yeshua? As children through Yeshua, the anointed one, unto himself according to the original purpose of his will. This is what his whole purpose of his will in creating this world. For the praise of the glory from his grace, which he freely heaps upon us in union with the beloved one. Now, speaking about the original purpose of his will, let's look at Isaiah 46.10. He's the one who declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done even, saying, my counsel will stand, I will do all my pleasure. How many of you know God has the ability to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants? But look at this, Ecclesiastes 3, 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Every purpose. Well, God created the earth on purpose. Okay? And his purpose was to create children that would follow him and want to be like him. Just like any parent would. Okay, we're going to jump now to 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 10. After all, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, self-discipline, so then never be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, he says, but join in partnership with me in suffering hardship for the good news, teaching according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. How many believe God saved you and called you to a holy calling? But look at this. It's not according to our accomplishments but according to his own purpose by grace which he uh, by grace which was given to us in the anointed one yeshua before the beginning of time but now it has been revealed by the appearing of our savior the anointed one yeshua he abolished what death and he brought purposeful life you now can live for a purpose and immortality to light through the good news message that is the real gospel and then in verse 7 through 10, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to the exceeding abundance of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Now look at this. This is important. In ever-flowing wisdom and discernment, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure of his original purpose, which he determined beforehand within himself, as a plan suitable for the end times. The fullness of times means the end times. The bringing together of everything in unity under the anointed one, things in the heavens as well as things on earth. Wow. Well, this also reminds me of another prayer as part of the Amidah where it says, you favor men with knowledge. You teach mortals understanding. Favor us with knowledge and understanding and the insight that comes from you. And this is exactly what he said. I'm revealing to you all these insights. Well, guess what? Look at Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may what? Do all the words of the law. Not so we can do away with all the words of the law. Okay. Let me. I have a problem. I have too many pages of notes. And what I have left is so good, but I can do it next week because I'm past my time. So uh, do you want me to go just a little bit more? Just, okay, I'll, I'll go a little bit more. Okay. I wanted to show you something. It talks about redemption a lot. We just got done reading in Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. We have redemption through his blood. Okay, look at Exodus 13, 13 through 15. Here it talks about the firstborn, what they had to do with the firstborn. And it says, and for the young of an ass or donkey, you may give a lamb for payment. Or if you will not make payment for it, then break its neck. 
But for all your first sons among your children, guess what? You can't break their neck. You got to make a payment. So when your son says to you in the time to come, what is the reason for this? Say to him, by the strength of his hand, the Lord took us out of Egypt, out of the prison house. And when Pharaoh made his heart hard and wouldn't let us go, the Lord sent death on all the firstborn of Egypt, man and beast. So every first male who comes to birth is offered to the Lord. But for all the first of my sons, I have to pay a price because Messiah is the firstborn. Okay, well, watch what happens in 1 Samuel 14, 1. It came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, this is Saul's son, said to a young man that bare his armor, hey, let's go over to the Philistine uh, garrison that is on the other side, but he didn't tell his father. So here, Jonathan goes over to fight the Philistines without his dad knowing, and look what happens in verse 24 through 27. You can read the whole chapter at home when you, if you want. But the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eats any food until evening, that I may be avenged on my enemies. So none of the people tasted any food, and all they of the land came to a wooded place, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people were come to the wood, behold, the honey dropped, but no one would put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But guess what? Jonathan, his son, did not hear when his father charged the people with the oath because he wasn't there. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand. He dipped it in a honeycomb, put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. And then look what happens in verse 38 and 39. Saul was upset because he knew someone had broken this oath he made. And Saul said, come near everybody, all you chiefs of the people, and let us get word from God and see who it is that sinned this day. For by the living Lord, the Savior of Israel, even if the sinner is Jonathan, my son, death will certainly be his fate. But not a man among all the people gave him an answer. Because Jonathan wasn't there. None of them did. And they're looking for Jonathan, and they can't find him. And Jonathan comes back, and Saul says in verse 43 through 45 to Jonathan, give me an account of what you've done. And Jonathan gave him the story and says, certainly I took a little honey on the end of my rod and now death is to be my fate. What kind of a father are you? And Saul said, may God's punishment be on me if death is not your fate, son Jonathan. And the people said to Saul, are you nuts? May God's punish, uh, he says, uh, is death to come to Jonathan, the worker of this great salvation for Israel? Let it not be so. By the living Lord, not one hair of his head is to be touched for he has been working with God all day. So the people are the ones who kept Jonathan from death. Well, guess what? Like Jonathan, each one of us have been condemned to die because of Adam's sin. And look at Psalm 49, 6 through 9. Those that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious and ceases forever that he should still live forever and not see corruption. So, wow, they redeemed Jonathan from physical death. But you can't redeem anyone from spiritual death. It's, it, you, are so, you don't realize how valuable you are to God. When God created the heavens and the earth, he spoke a word and heavens and the earth were created. How many gazillions of dollars is this earth worth in ore and buildings and timber and resources? Trillions and gazillions of dollars and yet it costs God nothing to create it. He just spoke it. And when it disappears, he could speak it and it'll come back. Okay? But you cost him everything. You cost him his son's life. You are worth more than all the gold and all the silver and all everything in the world. But the problem is we don't realize our worth. It's incredible. So in Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, in experiencing union with him, we've obtained an inheritance. Guess what? And it's worth a lot more than silver and gold. Having been destined beforehand according to the purpose of him who works everything according to the direction of his will for the final result. We're in the final result that we who were the first to find hope in the anointed one 
should cause his glory to be praised, not our own glory. In experiencing union with him, you yourselves have obeyed the message of truth, the good news teaching of your salvation. Moreover, you've believed, and so you have been sealed with approval in union with him by the spirit of promise, which is the guaranteed warranty for our inheritance until the final realization of our full redemption as the treasured possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, I'm, I've really got to stop. But we're going to, Jill will have to show the video next week. Uh, but I think you're going to love the rest of the book of Ephesians. You're going to want to be here. You're going to want to live stream it. Tell your friends. Next week is going to be a mind blower. I wanted today to be a mind blower, but I just can't. It'll have to be next week. So anyway, let's stand. I never know how long these are going to go. <laughs> Let me see something here. All right. <sighs> let's stand and let's pray. Avinu Malkainu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much and respect everybody's time. And I just pray, Lord, that um, everyone would put time with you as their priority, that even on the rest of this Shabbat, they would spend, uh, have their time focused on you. I just thank you so much for all those who are visiting uh, locally as well as visiting on the live stream. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that everyone would realize how expensive they are, how important and precious they are uh, when we think about it. God told Moses to tell Aaron, here's how I want you to bless my people. Not only do I want to bless them, I want to put my name on them. Wow, your name is above all names, and you want to put it upon us. Father, may we all live worthy of bearing your name, and may we all realize it's not about us. It's all about you. And as he said, Ivarekaka Adonai ve Ishmareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka, Isa Adonai Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Eyeh Asher Eyeh. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>